Hello, good morning and welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining us for this week's webinar. This week we're looking at the importance of financial planning um, during challenging times. Uh, this is part of a series of more Kingston Smith seminars where we're bringing together experts from across our practice to consider what challenges our clients are facing um, over the forthcoming months. Uh, my name is Mandy Merrin and I'll be chairing today's webinar um, and I'm as usual, going to be joined by our head of tax, Tim Stovold, and our head of HR consultancy, uh, Richard Cummings. Um, they will briefly update us on what's been happening uh, in the tax and HR world uh, during the week. And I suppose the biggest of those this week is the announced uh, review of the capital gains tax regime. And then after that, for the main session, I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined this week by David Hume, who's a financial planner and chartered wealth manager, Steve Wood, who's a certified financial planner, and Paul Beck, who's a chartered financial planner. Um, and they're all from more Kingston Smith Financial Advisors. Uh, during the sessions, questions can be posted in the Q&A function. Please post them in that and not in the chat. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to try and coordinate all the questions. Thank you very much. Um, to everybody who has uh, re responded to our advance poll. Um, I'd be very grateful if um, after the event, when we send around our feedback poll, you take the time to respond to that because it really does help us to make these sessions better and more useful for you. Um, I think that that was all my housekeeping notices. I'm gonna hand over now to Tim and Rich. Thanks, Mandy. Um, so, uh, as always, uh, Richard and I will spend um, hopefully just short of 10 minutes talking about an update on the week. Um, this should be, hopefully you can see the slides now. So, the big news and um, the press have made a bit of a meal of it, um, partly by us winding them up about it, um, over the announced review of capital gains tax. This started with a letter from the Chancellor to the um, Orwellian named Office of Tax Simplification asking the OTS to review the system of capital gains tax. Um, and, and the Treasury have now said this is normal, we do this all the time. Um, no, they don't. They, they, they don't conduct such a wide ranging review of a, 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 a one of the biggest areas of tax regularly. This is the first time something like this has happened in as long as I can remember. Um, this is the first indication of where we might see tax increases following the, 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 the all the outlay on COVID measures. Um, and this, these any tax increases or removal of reliefs or exemption could apply from as early as the autumn statement. So that, that's normally the first week of December, not even the autumn, but called the autumn statement. We could have changes there. In the past, the capital gains tax changes have applied from um, the actual budget day. So it's all, all likelihood it would be early December. Um, capital gains tax is a little bit of an also ran in the way of taxes, only, uh, probably only worth looking at the numbers in red there. In the, the most detailed statistics we've got, we have got them for later years, but they tell the same story, but 2017-18, uh, the total capital gains tax paid was short of nine billion. Um, it's not a lot of money in, in Treasury terms. So income tax collected 180, national insurance 131, and VAT 125. The tax system, those are the only three taxes that really collect any tax. That's 80% of the entire tax collection the country takes. You'll notice corporation tax is not there. So capital gains tax and corporation tax don't collect very much. It's only really big changes to income tax, national insurance, or VAT that will actually raise any money. That said, the Chancellor has asked the Office of Tax Simplification to look at these areas. Again, I'll only focus on the bits in red. So various rates, the 20% capital gains tax rate is pretty low um, and, and that we may see that go up for um, assets like stocks and shares. Reliefs, the main relief that's getting attention in the press, again, largely fueled by us, but it is in the detailed document, is principal private residence relief, the relief you get when you sell your own home. It's unlimited, so if you sell your mansion and make £20 million profit, that's all tax-free. Um, the Americans have a system that only exempts $250,000 per person, and we are drifting towards a more US-style system of taxation, so we may see principal private residence relief um, restrictive. The annual exempt amount, plenty of financial planners, we'll hear from them soon, um, use the 12,000, 12,500, whatever it is now, annual exempt amount for capital gains every year to, um, to wash out some gains. We could see that withdrawn for higher earners. Higher earners don't get an income tax personal allowance, but they do still get a capital gains tax annual exemption. That may end. 
the review excludes trusts and residents and domicile hell issues i read into that we're going to get separate reviews of those areas and probably um you know watch this space for how that will change going forward um skip down one the position of standalone owner managed trading companies read into that it's entrepreneurs relief or as what's now called business asset disposal relief the chancellor's going to find it quite difficult to stand up and say there's still justification in individuals paying tax at 10 percent um, when we've just spent 190 billion out on on propping up the economy. So whilst we all know and believe that entrepreneurs relief is something good and should stay, it might have a very limited lifespan now. Um, and then the final bit that I think jumped out from the scope was the talk of interaction with inheritance tax. This has been mentioned a few times that on death, um, assets that pass to spouse or assets that pass in some other inheritance tax free way still get uplifted to probate value for capital gains tax purposes so uh, it means that the, the all historic gains are washed out on death with no inheritance tax charge that is a, a tax treatment that's been under threat for quite some time so we may see that come to an end so that and many other things could change um and, and even if he doubles the amount of capital gains tax collected it's only going to increase collections from 9 billion to 18 billion which is still one tenth of what income tax collects. So even if we have quite draconian changes to the system of capital gains tax, it's unlikely to collect enough. So expect more changes coming down the line. That's it from me. Over to Richard. Thanks very much. Um, there's only one major update really this uh, this week on the job retention scheme and that's notice periods. As you know, I've been saying this every week, uh, it doesn't appear on the public guidance if you want to use job retention scheme monies for notice periods. It has just appeared on there and it says that employers can still use the scheme to pay statutory notice uh, given to an employee. So if you have an employee who's got three month notice but they've only been with you for two years, their statutory notice effectively is only two weeks. So you wouldn't be able to use the scheme for the whole three months as it stands on the public guidance so our advice remains the same do call HMRC just to check that they're quite they're, they're okay for you to use it for the whole amount and um, generally they have been um, but that might change as well so but again it's not on the public guidance and then just one reminder as peculiar as it is um, there's loads and loads of companies that are offering out voluntary redundancy if one of your employees opts to take voluntary redundancy you still have to give them the right of appeal uh, even though they have asked to go and um, it is a bit peculiar but it is a it, it is the case law dictates this so for the sake of writing you have the right to appeal this within seven days uh, you could get yourself out of any potential hot water uh, that's the only updates from me this week thanks very much lovely thank you very much uh, both. Um, I'll now hand over to David, Steve and Paul. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Mandy. Just get uh, my screen up. Apologies. <laughs> I need to share my screen first, don't I? Just for those who are just joining us, that was Tim and Richard's normal tax update. Uh, and now we're turning to the main meat of today's session, which is the importance of financial planning advice during challenging times. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, hopefully you can now all see my screens. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of financial planning during the challenging times. Uh, so that you know it, it's been unprecedented times uh, I think we, we can all safely say that uh, there's been increased volatility and let's be honest uh, we're all human uh, so uh, we, we've had lots of conversations with clients during these times um, and you know we, we, really what's been important to our clients is for us to try and put uh, things into perspective for them uh, if we look back uh, it was back on the 24th of February uh, that the news of uh, worsening events in China uh, first hit and the, the Dow Jones fell 3%. Well, none of us realised what was going to happen. Uh, it wasn't until the next week that the markets went into the greatest fall uh, since uh, the banking crisis in 2008. Uh, the S&P standard pause fell on the 9th of March by 7% in four minutes. Uh, on the 10th of March, the next day, it fell by a further 9.5%. So 
it was worrying times. And, uh, you know, the, the FTSE 100 ended falling by uh, nearly 32% uh, at its lowest. So uh, what was important for us, uh, for, for us to reach out uh, proactively uh, to, to speak to our clients. And surprisingly, uh, it was actually a lot of the younger clients who needed more reassurance uh, because they hadn't seen these falls before. Uh, so, uh, as I say, we've been kept very busy uh, during, uh, during this time. Some of our more risk averse, experienced clients, uh, in fact, felt it to be a rare opportunity. And uh, as uh, Warren Buffett uh, famously said, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And uh, I'm pleased to say uh, that they were rewarded. However, uh, you know, most of our clients were more concerned about being able to sleep at night and, uh, you know, wanted to understand what was best going forward. Uh, so generally, uh, time in the market uh, is definitely rewarded more than market timing. And um, what I'm showing you here on this slide is really what's happened in the past, because none of us know what's going to happen in the future, but we do know what's happened historically. So what I'm able to show you here is what's happened going back, and you'll, you'll see uh, the, the largest falls here going back to 2008. And this shows the difference if you panicked. And what we've been encouraging clients to do is not panic during this time. And you know, if we look back, if a client had come out of the market and then stayed out of the market for 12 months, this is the difference it would have meant to their returns if we look back historically. If we even take it one step further, and during the falls this year, if they'd come out and cashed out, it would have actually left a, a difference of 53%. Well, I'm pleased to say we did encourage the majority of our clients to keep in the market because that is definitely what we would be recommending. So, if we, we look at really what, what has been the, the, the main driver for returns uh, is having that long-term perspective. Uh, we've been having uh, sort of many conversations with clients, uh, but uh, what we've really had is, is the, the quickest rebound in the markets, uh, which is a, literally what's been referred to as a V-shaped recovery. Um, but, uh, you know, clients have been asking us why. What, what, why is this uh, rebounded so quickly? There, there's no economic um, evidence for, for this to have happened. And, and really the, the main reasons uh, that people are saying, and you, you can see, is that the, it's the fiscal and monetary stimulus which has uh, been uh, made by all the, the, the leading global governments and banks, uh, which, which really helps to explain. And to be honest, this should help underpin the markets for the time being, despite uh, the, the, the poor economic news we've seen. So where should you be invested uh, and how much risk should you be taking? Uh, every client is unique, uh, but what we, we show you here uh, is uh, what we refer to as a patchwork quilt, and it shows the top performing asset classes over the last five years, and also the worst performing during the last five years. And what you will see from this is that generally, it's not one asset class or uh, one particular global asset class that's always performed best. And, you know, as I say, it's really important uh, diversification of your, your assets is key. Um, so during the conversations we, we've had, uh, I had a conversation with a client last week, 80-year-old widow. She was, was heavily uh, invested with an equity bias. Uh, and during our conversation, it was, we, we, you know, we, we found out that she was struggling to sleep at night because she'd seen such volatility. And really when we explored a bit more, we found out that uh, she had more than sufficient assets to be living comfortably without even taking any risk at all. So we've now down risked her and, uh, you know, once the, the markets have recovered slightly and a lot of them are, are levels where they, they were originally. So uh, what that means is that uh, she can now, I'm pleased to say, sleep at night. Um, so when we look at the different assets, and again, this, this uh, chart here uh, shows the performance for quarter one uh, and it shows you how low equities fell during that time. 
If I was to do a, a more update one to the end of quarter two, it's just passed, then in fact, uh, US equities would have been the top performing asset with a 20.54% return. So, uh, as I say, it's important to consider where you're invested and to consider diversification of your assets. We do encourage you to consider the risk uh, level you're in at the moment. Um, so what I do show here uh, is further uh, back up for that importance of diversification and generally risk and reward go hand in hand. Um, but uh, what we can actually see here uh, is up until the end of April, uh, then in fact a balanced portfolio of 60% in equities and 40% in fixed interest securities actually performs and outperformed stocks uh, or equities uh, as you can see. So it's quite an unusual event and to be honest I'd be surprised if that happens again over the next 20 years but it does show you the importance of having that diversification because one asset may outperform another uh, during uh, the, that period. So with our clients working more from home, uh, you know, or uh, they, they may have been on furlough, uh, then this time has been uh, a great opportunity for self-reflection. And uh, during that time, we've been encouraging clients and having conversations about their levels of wealth and assets, and quite importantly, the, the policies, uh, as well as uh, their, their wills and lasting powers of attorney. And uh, we've been working quite closely with our team at MKS and, and referred a number on uh, to them to, to help review those arrangements. So it, it's really important if you haven't used this time to sit back, uh, look at your nomination forms for your pensions and your life assurance, uh, uh, as well as all your other policies. What we have seen uh, a significant increase in as well is, is frauds and scams taking place. And the FCA have been quite heavily uh, uh, advertising and suggesting clients are very wary. Um, to give you an idea, there's been over 300 incidents, I believe, this year, uh, which have been successful uh, with clients losing over four million uh, in cash. So please be extra vigilant. Uh, we uh, ourselves, uh, one of my colleagues, had a conversation with a client who was looking to invest 270000 into a bond online. Um, uh, following the conversation, it was pointed out this was a scam and we, we stopped him making that payment. So uh, it's really important to, to seek professional advice uh, before you make any investments, if you can. So the, the last really area I'm going to talk about personally is, is really uh, ensuring that you have everything put together in one place, whether that's a spreadsheet or a Word document, uh, and ensure your, your partners or spouses are aware where that information is, because clients have been thinking, what would happen if it was me? Uh, and if it did, th this would, would help uh, at, at that difficult time. Uh, I am pleased to say that we've now got a new client portal. This is just showing you a very quick snapshot. Uh, and it shows uh, sort of where all your assets and liabilities are. It, it will be able to have documents downloaded into it in a safe place. And many of our clients have found this very useful. So, you know, just consider if that sort of tool is available to you. So thank you for your time for me. Uh, I'm now going to pass across to my colleague, Steve. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Black Swan events come along from time to time in the financial services world. Uh, they've got three traits. Uh, they are rare and beyond the normal realms of expectation. Uh, they come with extreme impact. And obviously we've seen that with COVID and the expense to uh, governments around the world in supporting the working population. And then post the event, people actually try to rationalize what's happened. And, and they say all along, oh, we could have predicted this when in fact the actual occurrence is way off of the norm. So, so what are we seeing with COVID and what have been our, our experience of that and also previous uh, Black Swan events like the financial crisis of 2008. Well, as, as David mentioned, um, we have seen clients, individuals reevaluating exactly what they want from life. Uh, and to do that, uh, maybe for the first time, they're looking actually at sort of attempting some lifestyle financial planning. 
uh, at the centre that is is cash flow planning and modelling because that will actually sort of help clients understand where they are, where do they want to be, how do they get there, and are they on target? And as with any planning, it's really important as you would inform this plan, as you would have plan, stress test to stress test what will work, see whether, whether it will work, you can, whether it will actually get you there. And of course, uh, and of course uh, uh, accounts being paid and accounts are always looking, we're always looking to possible tax Steve, so, Steve, uh, can I just so interrupt for a moment? Yeah, um, sure. I, I don't know if it's the same for everybody else on the call, but it's really you're really breaking up for me. It's quite difficult to hear. I don't know. It looks to me you're a bit pixelated, as if you're having trouble with your internet connection. I don't know if that's something that um, right. David could cover if we can hear him better. Uh, oh, Steve's internet connection uh, recovers. Am I breaking out? Am I breaking up? You are breaking up a lot. Yeah. Right, um, right. Um, we, we were fine earlier, we were, we were fine earlier so I'm not sure what's gone on. No, Dave, David, is this something you could cover if we could hear you? Um, I, I could give it a go. Um, <laughs> sorry, so sorry Steve, it's just that it's yeah. actually okay. it's very difficult to okay. hear what you're saying, I'm afraid. Right, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, Really, when we, we, we look at what's happened uh, for, for, for clients, uh, we, we were talking about certain events, uh, Black Swan events that, that uh, Steve was, was expanding on. What uh, has, has been really important, uh, we've we found for clients, is, is really sitting back and looking at the impact of, of such events. Uh, it may be that uh, clients have been looking to uh, retire early. Uh, it, it may be that, uh, that they've been looking to plan to, to, to sell their business uh, as their, their, their retirement. And events as such as what we've just seen uh, can obviously put uh, quite a spanner in the work, shall we say. Uh, so, uh, you know, some clients uh, and their businesses have obviously uh, done particularly well due to their, what, what they're in, but a lot of clients, they would have seen the value uh, of, the, of their uh, business fall significantly just before maybe retiring. So it's really looking at uh, ensuring you've, you've got a, a diverse, uh, I keep using that word in my earlier presentation, diverse range of assets. It's not all down to you selling the business. Uh, that may be looking to, to save tax efficiently, uh, you know, moving monies out of the business uh, into other assets. It may be even having rental property, many different things. We also use cash flow modeling uh, for uh, ensuring clients are, are using uh, their, their other allowances. So that may be looking at uh, intergenerational wealth transfer uh, and looking to make regular gifts uh, or maybe save tax efficiently into junior ISAs, JISAs uh, or stakeholders for your children. So we, we can then stress test that planning for, for, for clients as well. Uh, so we can show uh, if there is a significant fall in the market, uh, what impact that may have. And quite importantly, when we're doing this sort of planning, uh, tax, uh, especially as we work uh, together with our tax uh, experts, uh, is really important. And we consider that uh, as part of the planning. So this just gives you a quick snapshot uh, of how that works. Uh, and I say we, we do a lot of this planning now, now for clients, uh, whatever we're looking to do, whether that's investments, whether it's uh, retirement, uh, whether it's inheritance tax, it has quite an impact and it is, is quite visual. And many of our clients have found this really useful. Uh, Tax efficiency, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a really important area. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking to build uh, wealth pots outside maybe your business. Uh, you are able to uh, use your annual allowances, uh, which are up to 40,000. Per, per tax year into your, your pension, depending on your earnings. Uh, and you may be able to go back and, and use past allowances uh, using what's known as carry forward. So important that you, you seek advice at that side, what's the most uh, efficient way of extracting those profits? Um, and it's not just pensions, uh, that there are other allowances you can take advantage of. Uh, I have some clients who now have over a million pounds uh, in ISAs. Uh, 
uh, just by doing their, their annual ISO allowances. Uh, so you're currently able to invest 20,000 per individual uh, and now 9,000 uh, for uh, juniors as well for your children. So it, it's worthwhile making those investments where your, your assets will grow uh, tax-free uh, and be able, uh, uh, so there for your, your, your futures. Um, And uh, again, we would encourage clients at the start of the, the, the tax years uh, that, uh, that they should consider using their allowances. Uh, many clients, and uh, uh, I say we, we do tend to have a bit of a rush just before the end of the tax year, uh, clients looking to, to make these investments. And I can understand reasons why. Uh, as I say, you may not know if you're going to have that money available, so you leave it to the last minute. Uh, but we would encourage you to look to use those allowances early. Uh, because you're going to have a whole extra year of hopefully tax-free uh, growth. Um, uh, but uh, also it's a, a bit of a use it or lose it scenario. So uh, generally with devices, for example, if you don't do it that tax year, uh, then you have to wait until after April to do your next one. Um, time of the market, uh, I've already really covered this, uh, Trump's market timing. Uh, but a lot of clients do also like we're taking advantage of what's called pan cost averaging. So again, especially if you're a little more risk averse, then uh, as I say, there, there can be the benefit of making regular contributions. So you may prefer to, to set up your, your ISO and your pension contributions to be paid on a, a monthly basis. This means that you're going to be buying into the markets at different times uh, of, of highs and lows. So you're smoothing out that risk uh, of investing. Uh, asset prices uh, are, are lower than they were. So uh, again, we, we've had quite a lot of conversations with, with clients about should they be looking uh, to, to take money out, um, as I say, whilst asset prices are lower. Uh, and this is more in relation to maybe what's known as your lifetime allowance, uh, where you have just over a million, uh, maybe higher if you, you've got fixed protection uh, as your limit uh, you can have in a pension. So if the market has fallen, and uh, there, there may be a, a tax benefit of, of accessing that, that pension uh, earlier. So is there going to be changes uh, with tax and regulatory? Well, I think I can comfortably sit here and say yes. Uh, what I can't tell you is what that is going to be. But uh, I know Tim obviously covered some of uh, the, the current thinking earlier. So some of the planning uh, that you can look at, uh, as I say, is, is looking at crystallizing those losses against other gains. That may be if you, you have existing assets that you, you're not happy with and you, you wish to maybe consider others. Uh, then uh, whilst uh, you know, things are low, uh, you may say, well, let, let's uh, cash out of those investments and we can set them against other gains that I'm going to be taking. Uh, but more often than not, this is really referring to uh, using your, your pension uh, and maybe crystallizing uh, the lifetime allowance if your fund's below that level at the moment. Um, we talked about the importance of when you're coming up to retirement and really the, the, the life of financial planning has changed. Uh, it used to be that you used to save uh, up to age 65, take your tax-free cash, and then take an annuity to provide you an income in retirement. Well, times have changed, and I'm pleased to say that things are now far more flexible. Uh, there are options such as a, a flexi-access um, uh, pension that you can look at. Uh, so it's really looking at your whole pot, and it may be that you're, you're looking to take your, your, your pension uh, or your pension income, retirement income, from other assets before accessing your pension. So that's me. Uh, I'll just cover for Steve. I'm now moving on to my colleague, Paul. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, apologies for the um, internet issues there. Um, well done, Dave, for stepping in there and doing that bit. So hopefully I won't be challenging you on employee benefits because you'll then really have to show your diversity of experience. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, good morning. So um, this presentation looks at uh, employee benefits through lockdown and beyond. Um, it looks at things mainly from an employer's perspective, although it's equally relevant to consider things from an employee's perspective as well. Um, under the current circumstances, companies really need to consider um, how their employee benefit packages can provide mutual support through this difficult period. Um, an employee benefit 
can be anything really you can imagine um, but there are certain benefits that are really useful in the current climate and it's always worth considering and reviewing these um, and given that current climate um, we're going to be looking um, at some key benefits um, that we feel and we've been speaking to clients that really prove useful during this period um, so looking first at private medical insurance so we'll just move on Um, private medical insurance um, as an employee benefit gives access to immediate treatments so for some of the most acute conditions um, in the many private hospitals throughout the UK. Um, private schemes help many members through treatments such as cancer. Um, I can never say this, but I'll attempt it. Musculoskeletal conditions, that's really bones, uh, really, um, and things like that. Mental health issues and many more. Um, most private medical plans come with a suite of employee benefits outside those basic provisions as well, which many aren't aware of. And if you have a deep dive into those, um, there could be things like virtual GP services. Uh, GP services um, in the NHS, you typically would roll up at your GP, uh, visit the doctor face to face. Virtual GP has actually become much more common, obviously in the last few months. Virtual GP has been available under private medical schemes and particularly for working employees they haven't had to take time out work to visit their gp they could do it virtually we've all got used to the virtual world as you know um, with um, webcams and zoom calls over the last few months um, lifestyle management tools and discounts in schemes um, gyms for example obviously reopened this week but many medical insurance schemes will provide lifestyle and discounts um, the other point really to mention about private medical insurance, um, the government um, are using private medical facilities to help ease the burden on the NHS because of COVID-19. So the resource of schemes will be affected. So it's really important that um, employees, if they have these schemes, are aware of that. So they won't become frustrated if their treatments are delayed um, because of that. So it's about managing expectation um, in that area. Um, Probably the final point to mention on that, though, is if, you, if there are ongoing claimants, um, it's likely that they won't be affected. I can't say definitely won't, but ongoing claims um, shouldn't be affected, but it's worth checking. Um, looking at a probably very undersold benefit, and it's probably come to the fore in the recent months, is something called an Employee Assistance Programme, uh, short EAP. We do love acronyms in this world. Um, but these schemes uh, can provide telephone, online or face-to-face, -face, um, socially distanced, probably at the moment, counselling um, that can help with many of life challenges and stresses that we all face. Um, and these schemes can be provided really easily through an employer. So if as an employer you have one or as an employee you have one, um, it's probably worth looking at what it can provide. Um, the NHS 111 service um, is, is probably people familiar with it the point of breaking it probably was before the pandemic um, but definitely now um, so it's really good uh, if you have one of these schemes and look at what it can provide because um, it can answer many questions not just about the virus but obviously general health and well-being issues um, then just moving on to income protection and sick pay insurance um, there's much we don't know about COVID-19 at the moment and it's been a very le steep learning curve for the medical industry for, obviously but the long-term effects could be far-reaching and it could have an impact on employee absence. Um, now income protection is a, an insurance that you can provide um, as a company to your employees as an employee benefit that will keep your staff safe from financial loss in the event that they are unable to work. For an extended period of time that could be way up until retirement in an extreme scenario where somebody falls ill and never returns to work um, it also protects the employer from funding an employee's salary in that period um, income protection also comes with attaching benefits um, i've already mentioned eap and virtual gp services but often they're automatically included within the income protection scheme um, sick pay insurance can be dovetailed um, sorry, Dave, just briefly to go back that slide, so I've just finished off the sick pay insurance point. Um, income protection schemes typically kick in after a period of, say, three to six months of illness or absence. But you can also bridge the gap with sick pay insurance, um, which can provide immediate cover for income up to 52 weeks. 
Um, so you can run both schemes alongside because there often is a void between uh, when the actual income protection scheme kicks in. Um, so that covers income protection and sick pay. Um, we're now going to look at um, group life insurance um, and critical illness insurance. Um, obviously, we've seen the headlines of the number of deaths. Um, so death um, is something everybody will eventually face. Um, but obviously, we've seen it happen a lot more in recent events and families. And um, if you have obviously known anybody who suffered, I uh, empathise with you. Um, but it brings it more to the forefront of um, everybody's mind. Um, under group life assurance, which is provided by many companies, um, it provides a level of insurance as an employee benefit, the amount of cover normally up to uh, a, a multiple of salary, up to prescribed limits. Um, but one of the important things about this scheme is in a company, you get something known as a free cover level, which is an amount of cover that can be given without any medical health evidence. Um, this can be very relevant if um, somebody has an illness in the company that's life-threatening. Um, so the cover is provided up to prescribed limits. The bigger the scheme, the higher the level usually. Um, but it will pay out in the event of death and provide it's arranged appropriately, that payment is tax-free. Um, another add-on, if a death does occur, these schemes provide uh, professional bereavement counselling um, to immediate family members who have suffered um, in the period and they have a dependent who has deceased. Um, Dave mentioned in his presentation about reviewing beneficiary forms. Um, if these schemes are in existence, it's important you review those as well to make sure that speedy payment is made. Um, just touching briefly on um, critical illness, um, this pays out um, an amount of benefit typically linked to a multiple of salary again if um, an employee suffers a critical illness such as heart attack, stroke or cancer are the sort of main ones. There are other illnesses, but they're the three key ones that most people um, are aware of. Um, COVID-19 isn't specifically covered um, under critical illness, but if, as I mentioned, we, there's a lot we don't know about COVID at the moment. And if um, an illness uh, manifests because of COVID that is deemed a critical illness, then this policy would cover that benefit. Um, similarly, uh, the benefit is tax-free to group life assurance, and you can have um, no underwriting up to certain levels similar to group life assurance. Um, just changing tact a little bit to move on to business protection. Um, succession planning and business continuity um, will be at the forefront of many smaller employees' minds right now. Um, not just smaller, but any employer. Um, and where you reliance on key individuals is critical to the future success of that business. Um, it's surprised many organisations make no provision for this cover. Uh, most companies um, insure their buildings if it burns down. Um, most companies insure their fleet of cars. Um, they don't insure their key people. Many do, but many don't. Um, so if a key employee did become unable to work or even um, sadly passed away, um, a well thought out business protection plan um, would help the company with ongoing cash flow concerns, potentially pay off debtors, deal with transfer shareholdings in a really cost effective way. Um, so if your business is reliant on key personnel, and I mentioned it'd be unlikely that it isn't, um, it's essential for continued business operations. Um, just to finish up um, on salary sacrifice, um, I've lost my slide. We're back. Thank you, Dave. Um, as a benefit position and cost controls come under greater focus in this period, um, if you have salary sacrifice schemes in place, great. Um, but there may be benefits that aren't using the benefit of salary sacrifice. But if, as a business, um, your company doesn't have salary sacrifice, um, the introduction could generate significant savings um, for both the company and the employee. Um, these savings can either be retained um, to reduce company costs. Uh, most companies uh, will be looking at reducing costs where they can. Obviously, they've been supported by the government in many cases. But if they can save some money, it is possible that this salary sacrifice scheme could do that. Um, also, from an employee perspective, um, if benefits aren't currently using the salary sacrifice facility, it may be that net take-home pay can be increased 
by changing the way benefits are structured. So I'm sure as an employer, if you went to your employees to say that your net take home pay is going up because of restructuring of benefits, they'd be very pleased, especially if they've suffered um, reduction in income, for example, they've been on furlough and they're returning to work. Um, there's just some examples that are up on the screen that benefits you can provide through salary sacrifice. Some are very tax efficient, some you don't get the tax breaks on, but there is a whole array of employee benefits that can be salary sacrificed. So it's definitely worth considering um, introducing salary sacrifice. If you don't have it, if you do have it in operation, it definitely merits a review. Um, that's me finished. Um, so I think it's back to Mandy now for some uh, questions, if we have any. Paul, that's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, we've got five minutes now for questions before we close. Uh, please do post any questions in the q and I'm happy to say we've got some questions that came in in advance and thanks very much for people who submitted those. Um, one of the questions is, and it's aimed, it's aimed at um, MKSFA, I'm due to retire in a couple of years and I watched the value of my pension plummet. Should I just weather the storm now or should I be moving my fund into cash in case there is another crash along with a second COVID wave? So probably to David Hume, I think that one. David, do you want to just unmute and um, come back? David, you're on mute, I'm afraid. There you go. Okay. Sorry, I was, I was just in the middle of trying to get my settings right. Um, sorry, could, could you just repeat the question? Yeah, um, I, the question is, I'm due to retire in a couple of years. I've watched the value of my pension plummet. Should I just weather the storm now or should I be moving my fund into cash in case there's another crash along with a second COVID wave? Okay, uh, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, and it is one in a way that I, I covered during, during the, uh, the presentation that uh, time in the market is the most important thing that there are a lot of concerns uh, about will there be a you know a, a second wave and um, you know I, that that could well be the case um, but uh, as you know as long as you're not looking to access your your full fund uh, immediately then I'd be confident that over time that uh, that the market will recover um, and uh, you know that's when uh, really falls on the market are crucial uh, when you've got a particular uh, date and time in mind that you need to access the full fund if not then I, I would encourage uh, you know to, to keep in the market the, the, the markets have recovered to some extent though so you, you may just want, wish to consider uh, down risking to some extent but no I wouldn't be encouraging moving all into cash uh, because, you, as I say, you, you, you may be missing uh, that opportunity. Okay, thanks very much, David. I think this is also a question for either you or Paul, um, but uh, with the Chancellor looking at areas where he can raise tax, do you think that the 25% tax-free lump sum from pensions will finally be scrapped or restricted? I'm, I'm happy to cut that one. Um, I, again, this has been talked about for many a year now. Uh, and, and I'm sure if uh, Tim had been doing these presentations, he would have been talking about this uh, year by year. Uh, it's being talked about being scrapped. Oh, I've uh, asked that it, it's going every year for the last 10 <laughs> years, David. I know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th th there's no yes or, or no, is it going to happen? My, my personal thoughts are it's unlikely uh, to, to be removed. There, there are uh, probably other ways of raising tax will, which will be uh, easier for them to, to integrate with it being not so unpopular uh, as uh, really you know, you know, penalising people that have been saving uh, to, to live in their retirement rather than relying on the state. Uh, so, so why would, would the, the, the government introduce that before potentially, say, a raise in capital gains tax? Um, but um, time will tell. Great, thanks David. One final question before we close. I think this is aimed at Paul. Uh, will the cost of private medical insurance for employers uh, increase post-COVID on the back of increased claims? Uh, I could give you a very simple answer to that. Um, I'll give you a simple answer and maybe a complicated answer. The simple answer is probably yes. Um, private medical insurance um, is, like any insurance, is governed by um, claims and medical inflation really in terms of cost. Um, claims are more likely to increase um, over the next 12 to 18 months um, if they haven't done so already. So the claims data will come through, which means 
more people have claimed. Um, so there will be a market rate adjustment. Um, secondly, medical inflation, um, the cost of treatment um, is likely to increase. Medical inflation is typically runs um, about eight to 12% a year pre-COVID um, um, in addition to um, retail price index inflation. So medical inflation has always been inflationary. Um, so I think the unfortunate answer, and I could be proved wrong, is yes. The actual quantum is difficult to predict, but given the past year, if you wanted to factor in maybe another 10%, over and above what you would typically have seen in the past. I don't mean that's unrealistic, but I wouldn't like, don't be, hold me on that number because I'm not <laughs> an underwriter and I don't monitor these statistics. Um, but unfortunately, the answer is probably yes. If it's no, then that'll be good news and music to everybody's ears. Um, yeah. I don't expect it. Okay, that's lovely. Paul, thank you very much. That brings us to uh, the time with you to close. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Just a, a replay again. Please complete the feedback poll when we send it round. We will also share the slides and the questions that we've discussed today. Thank you very much indeed um, to Tim and Richard as ever for our weekly update. David, Steve and Paul, sorry Steve that we managed to keep you out and um, look forward to seeing everybody for our webinar next week. Many thanks. Bye for now.